What does filmed for IMAX mean? It isn't just a movie that'll look great on IMAX's screens. It means that hiding from a sandstorm feels like fear in every flicker. And every triumph is felt in every sound wave. And the things we've only imagined, you can truly experience those too. That's what filmed for IMAX means. Get tickets to experience Dune Part 2 now and IMAX's exclusive expanded aspect ratio. Age of Radio. This week, a special for screen and country presentation. Brought to you by Viceroy Cigarettes, yes. When you have a colony to run and the natives are getting restless, calm your nerves with a Viceroy fit for a Viceroy. Folks, sometimes a movie is a war movie. But sometimes a movie just takes place in war. What's the difference? Why should we know? Who cares? These questions and more will be totally ignored this week on Is This Movie a War Movie or Is This Movie Not a War Movie? Yes, that's right. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, friends. Welcome. We are coming to you today live from the throne room in London, England, from Buckingham Palace. Yes, it was in the the center of London, England, I assume. That's where we are. We are coming to you live from the Queen's throne room. Now, I understand that she is dead, and technically this is now the King's throne room, but we don't care. We only acknowledge the Queen. We love the Queen. She was our Queen. Who's this guy? He's a king. That doesn't matter. Welcome to the greatest game show on the planet, which is, is this movie a war movie, or is this movie not a war movie? Hosted by me, Jason. And, of course, as always, my bodacious sidekick, Brandon. I was, like, almost convinced this is going to be just you this whole episode. Because I was, like, waiting. I was, like, I don't think Jason's going to introduce me. No, I was going to read out of steam eventually. Yeah. I don't have so much breath. I'm very fat. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jason, this is a... Okay, so it's, this is a game show now. I'm very excited. I, I guess... I don't know. I don't know how it works, but I I feel like we need the the trappings of a game show because that's what the kids want. No. That, if we're gonna appeal, if we're gonna get our name out there, we need to give the kids what they want. And what do the kids want, Brendan? Game shows. Well, that's what's popular right now. Now, are you gonna be, are you gonna be like a '70s game show host and try to like kiss me a bunch, or are you gonna be like a modern game show host and just be like a uh, an F list celebrity? <laughs> Well, I was thinking it'd be more appropriate if I was like a fifth, a '50s game show host and, and like a closeted homosexual, and, and we would have we would have trysts behind the scenes until uh, uh, Dorothy Parker got a hold of this information. I don't know why I'm picking on Dorothy Parker. I don't think she would out gay people. She seemed pretty cool, but and, it was the only old timey name I could think of. And are we just gonna be like super drunk the whole time? Oh, oh, incredibly drunk. Like drunk, uh, amphetamines, uh, what else? Mm-hmm. Probably some morphine, too. Well, we'll have okay. access to old Dr. Feelgood, the same guy that like uh, got Kennedy high. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Joe Kennedy, right? Well, all the Kennedys. Just Joe from uh, F- Fatherland. And, and not, <laughs> as everybody might be guessing, just Joe, the WWE superstar who wrestled on Sunday Night Heat for about six weeks. Uh, folks, Uh-oh. that is maybe the deepest cut I ever, I've ever made. If any of you listening knows deep. who Just Joe, the wrestler, former wrestler, is from WWE, please tell me. Jason doesn't even know. He's utterly no, confused. No, I don't. I, we, he, he said Joe. I thought he was talking about Samoa Joe. And I was going to say, well, I'd vote for Samoa Joe. No, it's not Samoa Joe. It's just Joe. Just Joe. Look, I propose we violate American federal law and we start funneling tons and tons of money into the United States into a presidential campaign for Samoa Joe. Worst case scenario, we spoil the ballot. Best case scenario, we get Joe elected. I um, I, I moved ma- I moved Brendan, to strike. Brendan. I think we rename him Samoa Joe Biden. That would be fun. That would be fun. I don't know that our current Joe Biden could pull it off, but if we got Samoa Jiden, Samoa, Samoa Jiden. Jiden. <laughs> We got Samoa Joe Biden, Samoa Joe Biden. Okay, yeah, yeah. I just, I, I love the idea of like the president. Actually, maybe we should do this with Biden too. Where like when he goes to do this, you remember like the last State of the Union address, right? When Clinton came down and they played Don't, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow, and it was like it was a fucking wrestling match. Remember that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so 
what if Joe comes? What if Joe Biden comes out at the next State of the Union address, and as he's coming out, everybody in Congress just starts chanting, "Joe's gonna kill you." Yeah, but you know what? Then it would probably be just like Republicans who were yelling that, and they'd be like, "We're referring, of course, to his Medicare plan, of which he has none, or something like that." That's how Joe's gonna kill you. And also, you know what, Brendan? Maybe he Brendan, should you, you, be. You did the perfect impression of a Republican. I'm sorry, I just had to say you did the perfect impression of a Republican because you they did you, they would have done the exact opposite of the thing they were criticizing him for doing. That's true. Also, um, I feel like uh, in this day and age, maybe making someone very white out to be Samoan might be the wrong call. <laughs> <laughs> he gets all browned up. Yeah. He comes down shirtless. <laughs> oh, he'll, 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 he might sway some of Trump's voters. Um, anyway. Oh, and if he, and he dyes his hair like fucking black, like, like midnight black or early two thousands, Joe, he does it blonde, like bleach blonde. <laughs> Yeah. Anywho. Uh, get the Ric Flair shit going. Um, wrestling references aside, uh, everybody yeah. has now pressed, stopped on the, pressed, pressed stop on their podcast app and threw their phone through the window. Because um, that's how you stop a podcast. You have to actually get yeah. rid of your phone. Uh, this is this is a podcast. We've said it many times, but this is a podcast called For Screen. And Country. And uh, you heard our names. I'm Brendan. And I'm Jason. And um, Jason, as, you, as that man said in the intro... Um, this is, this is a series, like you said, you, I know you joked, I, I know you made a little few cracks and some jests, as you said, mm-hmm. this is, a, uh, called, uh, is this a war movie or is this not a war movie? But really what we're doing right is now, is this a war movie or is this movie not a war movie? Sorry. Um, but what we're doing right now is we're going through this little blurb on Paste Magazine's list of the 100 greatest war movies because they listed a bunch that they thought, you know, these are great enough to be considered or even be on this list. But but with using our criteria, we decided that uh, maybe not. Maybe these aren't close enough, quite close enough to being a war movie to be considered on this list. Now, we're going to talk about like whether they are or not, but I mean, mostly it's just an excuse to watch the movie and discuss it. So, Jason, the movie we're discussing this week is from 1957, is the World War II film The Cranes Are Flying. Yes, Brendan, this week, The Cranes Are Flying is in the hot seat as this show decides, is this movie a war movie or is this movie not a war movie? Let's remind the viewers how the game works. At the end of the episode, Brendan and I will make a determination based on several objective factors that we will not tell you what they exactly are. At that point, we will make a decision between the two of us. We will vote. Is this movie a war movie uh, or is this movie not a war movie? If this movie gets two votes that it is, in fact, a war movie, it will receive two points. If this movie gets uh, two votes that it is not a war movie, it will receive no points. And if the votes are split, then it will receive one point. At that point, we will determine what the prize will be in the bonus round. Brendan, back to you. I feel like I feel like most of that was could have been assumed uh, based on based on uh, you know life. But uh, yeah, no, that's 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 great. There you go. You got your all set up now. Works. Yeah. Okay. A couple of gamers. Is that what they call game show hosts? Gamers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's why Bob Barker, uh, Bob Barker, and uh, and uh, Alex Trebek, two of the greatest gamers of all time. Oh man, it's so weird. I I told someone I'm not really much of a gamer, and they were like, "Well, I'm a huge gamer. So does that mean I I just talk to someone who hosts game shows for a living?" Yeah. Was I having Absolutely. a conversation with Tom Bergeron? You might have been. Wow. You might have been. Wow. Or, or or Wayne Brady from Don't Forget the Lyrics, because he did that sure. for a little bit. And then Sugar sure. Ray did. Anyway, okay, we got to talk about this movie. Um, okay. <laughs> so we, the Cranes Are Flying out of 1957, like I said. Um, this movie is a Soviet production. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. Those folks, we, they, we don't like the Soviets. They've always been evil right from the <laughs> beginning. No, no, uh, no good Soviets anywhere throughout all of history. We fought them Fact in World is. War II. They started the Holocaust. <laughs> okay. No, this is a Soviet movie. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some quick names again. Who wish me luck? And I'm trying to be as respectful as possible. But we have uh, Tatiana Samo- Sa- Samoilova as Veronica. 
in the lead role. We have Alexa, Alexei Batalov as Boris. We have Vasily Mercuriev as Fyodor Ivanovich. We have Alexander Shvorin as the very creepy Mark. And uh, we have um, Valentin Zupkov as Stepan. So all your favorites are here. Um, I say that as a joke, but maybe in, in Russia they're like, fuck, those are like three of our favorite actors. I don't know. I know I know. Dude Who Plays Boris is, is quite a legendary and well-known actor mm-hmm. in Russia, as I understand. Okay. Okay. At the time or just like now? No, he. I, I saw a picture of him like from like 2008 or something getting an award. Like he's been in stuff for a long time and he's like uh, – I think he's like kind of like he's always played. He's kind of like Henry Fonda. He's always played like kind of admirable roles in his career. I think. Okay. Um, and of course, the movie is directed by uh, Mikhail Kalatazov. Um, and I haven't seen anything else that he's directed, but he has directed movies such as I Am Cuba, Letter Never Sent, and The Red Tent. Um, so there you go. So that pretty much sums it up. Uh, thanks for joining <laughs> us this week. Now. Jason, this is a movie that I had very little knowledge about. Yeah. Like, I, I would say zero. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've heard tell of the occasional Russian film. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, a Battleship Potemkin, say, or mm. Solaris, perhaps, I, or I also, what was that other one? Battleship, Russian Ark? Battleship Potemkin is really fucking good. I've heard so. I have not seen it. Is it on the list? Uh, no. Come on. <laughs> uh, I don't know if, I don't know if it would fall anywhere, but anyway, um, so yeah, I didn't know a whole lot about this movie. I did know that having seen it being considered for this list and seeing this uh, very high rating on Letterbox and Rotten Tomatoes, I was very curious about it. Um, so of course, I jumped at the chance. Jason, why don't you tell us a little story, weave us a little tale, give us a little tiny plot sum up. What is this movie about? It's a tale as old as time. Boy meets girl. They fall in love. Boy goes off to war. Girl stays home. Frets. Boy dies. Girl's excited and won't give up on him, but then eventually accepts it and hands out some flowers. Now, let's get in a little more detail. So we've got Boris. Oh, that was perfect. I got it. I feel like I just watched the movie again. (laughs) We've got Boris and we've got Veronica, a.k.a. Squirrel, as he likes to call her. A little pet name, yeah. And they are two, uh, 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 well, so of course, this guy's like, you know, it's it's like the 40s. So he probably, you know, he's probably 19, but he looks like he's 42. So mm. they're they're in love and uh, uh, they're enjoying their life. But then guess what? Nazis invade. They tend mm. to do that. That's what they like to do. So, of course, you know, time, the motherland calls and everybody's getting involved and trying to help out. Even Irina, Irina, her friend joins up and starts wearing a uniform because women could join up with the Soviet forces because they were quite progressive and that they were more than happy to let women fight in certain capacities. <laughs> I actually note. didn't, I actually didn't even know that. So when I saw that in the yeah. movie, I was like, oh, <laughs> I, I think she's serving as some sort of a military nurse, but yeah, no, w- women did fight in combat units, and that's why I'm a quick side note. I want to see a movie about the Night Witches, the famous uh, mm. Russian uh, Air Force unit of women that flew in biplanes, mm-hmm. and they would attack uh, positions at night, and they would shut their engines off and glide in silently and drop bombs on like camps and stuff. <laughs> well, Jason, I've this got a surprise awesome. for you. Apparently, there is a movie called uh, In Flight Are the Night Witches. Sweet. But I don't know how available it is. <laughs> Put it on the list. I don't care. We'll find it. Yeah, we'll see. But, uh, yeah, so uh, the motherland calls, and, and sh- so she's at home with this guy, and she is her friend, but she doesn't want him to go to war, obviously, because she doesn't want him to die. And he, he kind of lies to her and says, yeah, no, don't worry about it. I mean, I might get drafted soon, but no, you know, whatever. And then it turns out he's going to join up anyways. Yeah. Now, she's in love with this guy, but she also has a problem where she has a cousin named Mark who has also confessed his feelings to her and well, kind of stalks her. He, and it's a little he creepy. has a cousin named Mark. It's not her cousin. Oh, it's his cousin. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was her cousin. No, no, no. <laughs> no, because she eventually stays with his family, right? Is that my own racism against Russians that I assumed that it was a cousin and I was like, oh, yeah, they're Russians. That, that makes sense. Yeah, you're, you, were like, uh, you were like Russia, the Alabama of Asia. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I assumed. And you know what? It's not true. And no. I can't make those assumptions. And I know there's people in Alabama that don't fuck their cousins. I'm not speaking to them. I'm not speaking to that minority of Alabama that doesn't fuck their cousins. But if you don't fuck your cousin, that's pretty cool. If you do, it's maybe, not. It's maybe not don't. that there's. 
It's not that in Alabama there's any more people that fuck their cousins than anywhere else. It's just that they tend to like it just a little bit more. There's a lot more. There's a lot more Alabamian podcasts about it. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's a hole that you don't want to dig in, sir. In this case, uh, uh, Boris's cousin Mark is also into Veronica uh, to a point where he's super creepy about it and kind of stalks her, and it's really annoying. But Vasily, not Vasily, that's a different movie. Uh, Boris signs up. And he goes to war, much to her chagrin. She's very sad about it. Uh, but he wants to get out into the field and serve the motherland. Meanwhile, they're, you know, they're there. Shit's going down. And the town eventually gets bombed at one point. Or at various points, the town gets bombed. At one point, she has to go down into the subway to hide out because they're in Moscow. Which reminded which, me you know, a little bit of uh, Atonement. Remember the very end of Atonement where we saw uh, poor Kira Knightley's fate? Yes, yes. And that was in my mind. I'm thinking, oh, man, look at all these people crammed in the subway. And it's like at the end of that, it's like, what if that happened? And How powerless, that would be. powerless. Yeah. Like you might be in the subway, but like that doesn't mean you're safe. They're not just like they're not just in there. They're crammed in there. There's a yeah. lot like this movie. You got to give this movie credit. They got a lot of actors to be in this movie or a lot of extras. Uh, I don't know if that's because the Soviet government was helping with this movie. So they probably had the resources of a bunch of people, but they had a lot of people in this movie in various scenes. Um, so yeah, so at another point, the town, the town gets bombed and her family gets killed, her mother, her father, and, uh, was there a sister or something else or brother? Or, I, I, don't I, don't, I don't think so. I think, no, I think it's just her mother, uh, her mother and father that, yeah. uh, she lives with and they are both killed off screen. Yeah. They're both killed off screen. So she's got nowhere to go, but of course, Boris's parents, Fyodor and, and his wife, are like, no, you can come live with us, obviously, because it's they know that she's pretty much engaged to their son. I don't know if they're officially engaged, but they're clearly that's the plan. They do um, openly say they're going to get married before yeah. Boris heads out. Absolutely. And she talks about she's going to make her dress just like her grandmother's dress with a big long veil. Mm-hmm. So as they're as they're living there, eventually it gets to a point where we see we see that uh, in the field, uh, you know, Boris is there. He's doing his duty. He gets into it with another soldier when the soldier starts talking shit about his girlfriend, which I always laugh at because it's like none of these guys know your girlfriend. What do you, what's it worth punching them for? You're just a f- but this was the time, right? Say something. Oh, you said something about my girlfriend. I better beat the fuck out of you. But then but again, of course, Jason, that just gets you got to think about how high people's. It's a very macho thing that they're doing, right? That's true. It's, 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 testosterone is high, adrenaline mm. is high. Oh yeah, you're gonna re, you're gonna react like that to shit, especially. Oh, I understand if why it happens. I just think it's silly. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> but modern, I'm, ju- I'm just, just from I'm just, modern eyes, it does seem silly. I'm just trying to understand because it's like imagine that's the one thing you have to come back to, and somebody just kind of steps on it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I guess so. You're you're one like the one thing you're holding on to. Yeah, because I mean, you could give a you you. If you if this guy was told like you're going home tomorrow, he'd be like, "Oh fuck, thank God." You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's he doesn't want to be there the whole time. He's just doing no. it out of duty to his country. And probably some social pressure as we've talked about in other movies and and you know. Yeah, he went to that same school that they did in uh, All Quiet. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah, weird that, that, that he German sh- guy transferred to Russia and was like, "I'll do your dirty work for you." And apparently time traveled to 30 years before. Yep. <laughs> so um so he's yeah he's he's he punches that dude, and then they go off on like a they're forced to go on a reconnaissance mission together, and Boris gets plugged. He does, he does, and and there is a really intense, well made like oh, flash light life flashing before his eyes, but also a, a vision of the wedding what? that he would never have. Oh, that's and it's and it's. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's it's an impressive piece of camera work in a, in a movie that has a lot of impressive camera work in it. I was going to say, that um, that does tend to be like a reoccurring theme in this movie, is that mm-hmm. the cinematography and the editing is very, very good. And like very um, not, not 1950s feeling. Hmm. Like you watch yeah. watch a movie in the, from the from North America in the 1950s. Like there are good yeah. movies in the 50s, but they're they're sure. usually they're usually very flat. You know. Yeah. This is this this guy was doing some cutting edge shit. I would say in 1957. Yeah. Uh, and that clearly influences stuff to come. But we'll mm-hmm. talk about that more once we get through the kind of setup of it here, the plot. So yeah. So he gets plugged in combat. 
dies in the field. But back home, they're not quite sure. They they get some word that he may be dead, but she, Veronica, won't believe it. Meanwhile, after one of the bombings, she, she was kind of cornered by Mark, who insisted, okay, so he's dead, like, you got to move on type thing. And then Mark uh, rapes her. Yeah. Now, I, I thought that was what happened, but it wasn't directly clear to me the first time or uh, the time watching it until I happened to like look at Wikipedia later and I was like oh it explicitly said I was like okay I guess I guess in 1957 even in the Soviet Union you know there was only so much you could say when it came to rape so you kind of had to imply it the way they did with him just carrying her off yeah well I think the whole thing with because he chases her around and locks the doors and then he's like pursuing her you know what I think is interesting Jason this is a, a movie made in the 50s and to see this portrayed in this serious deadly threatening manner was um, very interesting considering some of the movies we've seen from this era that portray a man who chases a woman as, oh, what a scamp. Like, he's, yeah, what he's, a, scamp. A, he's a real cut-up. Like, you know, it, I was I I don't know why I thought of Goldfinger. But yeah, when he no, th- I, I understand. He throws her into the hay, and she's like, no, 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 but eventually gives in. Like, this yeah. movie is not that. They are they're no. very explicitly telling you this is not wanted. It's not, this is not really cool. And... Yeah, and, and, and that leads to a scene where he tells – where they tell the, the mother and father, Boris's mother and father, that they're getting married. And it's great because nobody's happy in that scene. Nobody has a smile on their face. Everybody's sad, even mm. Boris. <laughs> well, Boris is not <laughs> or there. Or not Boris. I'm sure Boris is sad because he's dead, but – You mean Mark? No, I'm, I'm sure Boris is sad because he's dead. No, but I'm saying but, you, uh, you mean Mark. I do even, mean even yeah, Mark. Mark. Yeah. Even Mark is sad. Mark who – orchestrated this whole thing mm. i guess because if you rape someone then you have to marry them i guess that must be her social belief i mean it's probably a very traditional thing where if someone found out that she you know i say had sex but she was raped obviously but if someone found yeah. out that she had intercourse with this guy uh who's gonna believe her that she was raped on first of all and yeah well also that even these people would like that wouldn't be the thing that would make them hate him. No, it has to be when we get to the fact that he like had bribed his way oh, we'll into get an that, exemption yeah. from military service. That's the thing that shuts him down. Well, and that's the thing that makes them realize everything else too. But yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, so she's really holding on to the fact that Boris is still alive despite the fact that she's engaged to this guy. But uh, you know, it all comes to a head when uh, Fjordor is figures out that. Uh, Mark had bought his way out of military service. He had claimed that he had an exemption because he was like a pianist or something, or but he had actually bribed a guy to get it. And he finds out when this guy that wants to borrow a car so we can go fuck some girl he's so horny that he needs to go get a car with ration gas to go fuck this girl and he's calling in his favor and he's like look i got that exemption for your guy i don't know that could just not happen again he's like what exception he's like oh mark you know he gave me a bunch of money told me it was from you oh he did did he so not only does he find out that mark scammed his way to an exemption so he didn't have to go to war but he used fyodor's name to get that exemption his uncle exactly that that really pisses him off i'm sure Mm-hmm. among all the things that happened, but that really pisses him off. Yeah. Anyways. And then, and then towards the conclusion, obviously he's shunned. He's sent away. And, uh, Veronica eventually finds out, uh, the fate of Boris. Um, but I want to, uh, before we get into that too much, we got, we, we got to break down some of this shit, right? Sure. We got to break sure. it open like a coconut. I'm going to, I'm going to take this DVD. I'm going to smash it on the ground. Oh no. Jason, I've, I've, I didn't know discs were. I thought they were more malleable than that. No, no, they're quite brittle. Sorry. Uh, just give me a second. Amazon dot ca. You know what? No, local bookstore dot ca. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my big anti corporate stance right there in the middle of uh, this episode. Um. So. Can I say right off the bat, yes. we got to give credit to the Criterion Collection for mm. their restoration of this movie because yep. what, what would what should be probably a shitty print from the Soviet cinema in the seventies looks 50s. absolutely immaculate. Fifties, late fifties, so, or fifties, but uh, yeah, this yeah. movie looks absolutely immaculate. It, it's stunning, and it really drives home all the wonderful cinematography in the movie. It's yeah, it's a gorgeous restoration, which the Criterion Channel Criterion Channel I should say I should say Criterion in general. 
Um, they're always good at uh, they're always good at this though. Like I feel like if something is on Criterion, it's been given like the best possible treatment. There's there's not a lot of shitty looking things on the Criterion channel. You may not like everything that they put out, but I mean, a great deal of it is really good. But um, Showgirls looks the best it ever looked. I'll tell you that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You can never like. I don't think you can ever watch one of their movies and think like, well, they really half ass this one. Yeah. Like, I mean, there honestly, there have been the occasional DVD in the past where that has happened, but they've it's been a long time. I feel like maybe in the early years. Exactly. Or when when DVD mastering was still kind of a thing that was people were getting used to. Yeah, there was a couple of and some of those releases I think they actually later like re-released and fixed anyways. And and you best not tell me that they half assed their their version of Armageddon, possibly the best uh, critically reviewed Criterion collection movie of all time. Of course, right after uh, uh, uh Yojimbo. <laughs> so so good that it's not even in print anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, wow, that month, that one must be worth some money. Fuck, I should have bought it. You should have. Um, also, just a hilarious. Is the Rock still in print? I have the Rock. I don't know, but that's just a hilarious thing to own. Is Armageddon Criterion? Oh, maybe it was the Rock. Is Armageddon not on Criterion? Both. I thought it was. They both are. Okay, okay. No, but that's. I think that'd just be a hilarious uh, icebreaker at a party. Like, look what I got on Criterion. <laughs> um. That's what I do at parties. Uh, so anyway, let's talk about this movie, Jason. Let's 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 talk about it. You talked about how this movie is a great. It, it's a beautiful restoration, but yeah. just building on that, like you said, the cinematography and the stuff they do with the camera in this movie, um, it's impressive today. It was revolutionary in 1957. This is like mm. only a few years removed from I think Stalin's death. Right? Didn't he die in the 50s? 1952. So this is five years after his death. This movie is released. Yeah. So this was this was a big deal um, when he died yeah. because he had something called a cult of personality. Um, do, 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 do. Well, that's what it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally pictures of Stalin in the music video. Um, yeah. But he basically he had some very strict rules about filmmaking in the Soviet Union. Yeah. People were very like, you know, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. If it's a war movie, it's just got to be, you know, propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. But in this one, this is really one of the first war movies in uh, definitely coming out of the Soviet Union that focused on like kind of um, an individual perspective and like also the effect of war at home. And I think this is also like the first movie that dealt with stuff like draft dodging, war profiteering and uh, and the black market. Like yeah. these are these are topics unheard of in Soviet cinema before this. So this was a pretty. By the way, let me just let me just point out, Brendan, alleged war movie. We haven't got there yet. <laughs> well, we're, I'm just gonna call it a war movie, and then we'll. Make I don't her... want you to get sued. Right, right. I yeah. Um, Joseph War Bonds is on my case. <laughs> Paste Magazine is breathing down our necks, Brendan. Oh man, <laughs> Patty Paste at it again. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I'm... oh, I'm Patty Paste. I'm the publisher of Paste Magazine. Oh, no, not Patty Paste. You fellas better not be fucking with our list and our ideas, because if you do, I'll punch the both of you right in your fucking mouth. No, 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 hold on a second there, Whoa. Mr. Mr. Paste. Uh, oh my God, are you Jimmy Stewart? I don't care for for you Irish types around here. Oh, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I don't know if you know this, but I was in World War Two. And yeah. uh, another big, huge reveal killed a lot of Irish people, too. What? You did what? Uh, you know, they're always talking about their clovers and their uh, their bullshit like that. And old Jimmy just, you know what? It, it's it's going to be a wonderful life for me because yours is over. That's what I'd say to them before I plug them. And what side did you fight on? Ah, uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Tell you what, fellas, I'm going to leave, but uh, uh, keep it together, or I'm, I'm not going to be very happy. I just have to get past this psychopath, and I'll talk to you later. Goodbye! Uh, you're, you're welcome, uh, fellas. I, I'll kill him next time he shows up. It's okay. Patty's, Patty's all right. All right, well, I, I'll, be, I'll be at the door. Clarence! I, does, does he still... Uh, yeah, whatever. Don't, don't ask. Yeah. Um, anyway, the movie, yeah. uh, the cinematography, yes. So th there's several um, moments that I want to kind of mention. Uh, you did mention the one, the, the one of the ones that stands out the most is when Boris is actually killed, and 
he does this very slow like it's it's a very slow melodramatic death but in a in a mm. lesser movie it would just be a melodramatic death like there wouldn't be yeah. anything other than like you see him falling over very slowly and maybe he goes like veronica yeah. or something like that but in this one like you said it, like the whole world starts spinning and you see like visions of him marrying Veronica and going on to live together and and starting a family and you're like oh it's not just his life flashing before his eyes it's him like being like these are all the things that I'll never do now it's pretty tough it's pretty heartbreaking it is heartbreaking and it's so well done because all the elements are there that, that this exact like idea could have been done in a like a, a sitcom or something right and we've seen it we've seen it where like somebody has like a, a near death vision and shit um, all the elements are there but but this director is so talented that he takes what in such lesser hands so easily could have been stupid mm-hmm. <laughs> a parody of itself and rides the line and makes it heartfelt and 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 tragic and believable. And it's also, I gotta say, like I was pretty shocked that he died. In general, yeah. in general, I was shocked, and I was also very shocked that he died. Uh, I, I, this is not a long movie. This is like ninety-seven minutes. He dies mm. forty-five minutes into the movie, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Whoa!" Because I thought the whole uh, drama was gonna be, "Will he come home? Is he dead? Is he alive?" But we're not with. Veronica, we know more than Veronica, our main character. No, but here's the thing. Even, and I don't know, I, I can't speak for you, but for me, even though I have more information than Veronica, through till the end of the movie, I was with Veronica. I was like, he, is he still alive? Like, mm. he might still be alive. Like, he's going to show up and whatever. And he doesn't. This is, this is, because <laughs> that's fucking life, man. Yeah. No, that, you know what? That's true, though, because you, you do see what you think is him dying. But her her performance, the actress who plays Veronica, she's so believable and so mm. good, um, Tatiana uh, Samo Samoy Lova, um, mm. that you you almost like she's almost so believable and so good that you're like, yeah, yeah, no, there's a chance, right? There's a chance, right? Yeah. And you're hoping, but like you said, in the end, at the end of the movie, which I think we're we'll have to save that because the, 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 I yeah. think that's a beautiful ending too. But yeah. Um, the other one that really stands out for me, and maybe in a not so positive way, well, I mean, it's it's really good, but in a more dark way. But there, the scene you mentioned where Mark um, rapes, it gets to the point where he actually does rape Veronica. But the stuff leading up to that, so they're in this big like attic kind of space, and yeah. there's a piano, and Mark is playing the piano, and as he's playing the piano, the air raids are going off. And, mm-hmm. and and it's almost like they're kind of in sync with each other, like the piano and the raids. And then the bombs start going off. And then yeah. as you see and hear these bombs going off, it's just it's just ramping up this intensity as he's literally like chasing her down, like trying to like grab her and do horrible things to her. He tells her, like, I love you. And she's like, no, 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 this isn't this isn't for me. And he's like, no, I love you. Yeah. And it's just, oof, it's it's such an intense sequence. Yeah, and, and on one hand, it's like, dude, is now the time? But on the other hand, it's like, well, what other time is there, right? <laughs> but, it, I mean, Mark is not a good guy. Let's just... No, get, he's, no he's, he's not a good guy. He's never I mean, portrayed as a positive character at all. That's the thing. I mean, but is he is he a person who would do this anyway? Or is he a person who is, is either taking advantage of or in fear of the time that he's living in? And, and and that is the thing that allows him to go rape a girl. Would he do this if he wasn't threatened by war? doesn't really matter because mm-hmm. ultimately an evil act is an evil act. He did it. So, yeah. <laughs> he did it. So it doesn't really matter why he did it at that point. I think also – I'm like, just curious. I think – I don't know if he would take it as far as he took it. But I, I think back to the beginning of the – or near the beginning of the movie when Boris isn't even out of the country yet. And Mark is already being kind of creepy with her. Like, remember, he goes and he's like hanging yeah. out on the railing. He's touching her arm and everything. And he's not yeah. going full tilt, but he's like, you know, I couldn't resist coming to see you and all this stuff. And it's like, there's already red flags there. Well, and here's the thing, too, that I noticed watching this movie uh, uh, as a man mm. who doesn't have to deal with this in life. But but just seeing how for this for this character, for Veronica, her life 
whether she wants it to be or not, seems seems to kind of carry from man to man to man. And that doesn't mean that she's like out there just working her way through man to man to man. No. It's because it's what society demands. She's with her boyfriend, right? He goes away. They assume he's dead. She feels compelled to, I guess, go with this guy that raped her because that's what society demands. And then after that's all over, then she essentially latches on to the soldier guy that shows up that was there with Boris in the field and seems to be like kind of with him at the end of the movie. Yeah. And I mean, it's like he immediately, yeah. he's there and he immediately is there to comfort her, but it's like, oh, so he's there to fuck her. He just, he wants to fuck her too, regardless whether he wants to comfort her or not. Yeah. And it just feels like these women, it's like, that's what they go through. It's just like, is, is every man that's going to talk to me want to fuck me? And for a lot of women, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, probably. I mean, that's, that's got to be really fucking annoying, I imagine. Yeah, just imagine that's at the back of your mind every time you have an interaction with a male. It's like, is this genuine yeah. or is this person just trying to find their way to my pants? <laughs> like, yeah. And, and, um, the thing with like, I, when it, when I, I feel like, and it's not explicitly in the movie, but I feel like when he announces, like, you know, Mark announces, oh, we're getting married and everything. I feel like the ultimatum was if you don't stand there and say, if you stand there and don't, and say something, I'll tell them that you're a slut and you had sex with me. And you cheated on yeah. Boris, and they'll believe me. Like I said, they're not gonna. Who are they, are they gonna believe you over me? Like, come on. And they, you know, even then in the Soviet Union, I'm sure it was a time like, yo, you raped me. Well, you were asking for yeah, it. Yeah, what kind of what kind of dress with was with your little you wearing? peasant clothes on and your your burlap skirt? You were asking. Wait, for Wait, wait, you had clothes on? Like you were just asking to get them ripped off? Like, wait, why are you from Brooklyn? Yeah, you, don't worry about me. It's Brooklyn Barry from uh, the Soviet Union. Look, I I just always loved Russian women. <laughs> just love them. I, I, I've i been here since uh, 1942. Uh, I thought it was a good place to be. I thought, oh, boy. Oh, boy, was I wrong. Oh, Barry, now you've done it. <laughs> Well, I don't like that my new character was born out of that premise, but uh, I, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm a fan. I'm a fan of my own character. <laughs> Barry the Russian Pussyhound, Brendan's b- breakthrough new character. Brooklyn Barry the Russian Pussyhound. Brooklyn Barry the Russian Pussyhound. My apologies. Yeah, ooh, that was close, Jason. Thank you. I I appreciate your apology. Um. Okay, and then there's one other one that I want to talk about. Uh, one other like major use of like cinematography and everything. But there's one scene where. Uh, Veronica is going to commit suicide. Like she's at the mm. point where she's going to kill herself. I don't remember what happens right before that. Is that what that does not when she founds that finds out that, uh, that Boris is dead. I think it's just when she's overwhelmed because everyone, the whole family hates her because they think she's yeah. just, um, abandoned Boris. Like, you know, cheated on yeah. Boris and, 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 uh, is now going to marry Mark, but she gets, wasn't, the point- it, wasn't it too, was it maybe brought on by her father and, or her future father-in-law originally because of Fyodor like giving a speech where he's like, women who cheat on their men deserve nothing but contempt mm. and they should be left in the streets. Yeah. He, he, he says the, the quote I believe is, uh, from one of the other guys, broads like that are worse than the fascists. Yeah. Um, so she, she, contemplates throwing herself in front of the train um but then and so there's this scene where it's like the train and like you know her and it's almost like you're inside of her head right because everything's like swirling yeah. around and and then she sees like a child uh in in that's gonna that looks like he's gonna get hit by a car or something so she yeah. steps in and it swoops in and kind of saves him and then finds out his name is boris and then she it gives him like this yeah. really big hug which you know what i found believable because i feel like boris is a common name in, in the soviet true Union. very true uh, it, I mean, on one hand, it's a seem again, it seems kind of contrived by modern eyes, but at the same time, it is handled with such, such talent yeah. that I believe it. And she grabs him and Boris, obviously that's a sign to her that her saving this little boy named Boris, now it's given her something to live for and it's clearly a sign that she should live. I got, I know, I know this scene has a literal train in it, but for some reason mm-hmm. I thought of train spotting when this scene happened. Like Danny mm. Boyle kind of kind of style, just the just the the constant just like the, movements, you know. Yeah, yeah, where it's like spinning and it's like, is she falling over the railing or is she just dizzy or like what is? Because you don't know. Yeah. Until you realize that she hasn't jumped over and she looks and sees the kid and goes and grabs the kid off the road. Yeah, exactly. Like it, like you said, I feel this movie definitely feels like it's influenced um, other filmmakers, other movies. Oh no question. Um. 
since this movie is about <laughs> Veronica and Boris, maybe we should talk about them a little bit as a as a couple. Yeah. So early on, when we first see them, like you know, they're the they're carefree kids they and they're are. running through the city, and they're so they're, and they're so well represented as young people. Like they're just having and fun. I, they're silly. And I'm wondering, is this maybe after that they, they already know that the Germans are coming? Because the early parts of this movie, the cinematography is such that the streets are are empty mm-hmm. and they are foggy. And the architecture is that brutalist Soviet kind of look to it. And it's very eerie and almost a little Silent Hill uh, in there. Mm -hmm. Like, it's an interesting choice. And then compare that to at the end of the movie where we've got these scenes just absolutely packed with people after the war is over. Yeah. Well, and maybe that's that's an interesting juxtaposition, too, because like Mm. you have those dreary kind of uh, city look. With the just upbeat, cheery disposition of yeah. these two characters, it's almost like the world around them doesn't matter at that moment. Like they're just they have no. each other, and that's what they want. You know, that's that's they're living in the moment. They're they're yeah. enjoying their youthful exuberance, and that's when, uh, you know, when she comes home and and her mom says to her dad, "Oh, he's got her head all screwed up," and she he's like, "Hey." That's love, mm. giddiness, man. That's their young love. Yeah, and I, he, dad gets it. He's not a prude like mom. <laughs> Women, am I right? That's right, man. Barry, Ooh. what are you doing back here? I'm sorry. I just wanted to offer a quick comment there. That's thanks, Barry. Jim, can you get rid of Barry too? <laughs> it's okay, Jim. I'll uh, I'll see myself out the door. Well, that's all right then. Go go on, Barry. By the way, I appreciate your Dutch killing. Kudos. Well, it's always good to meet a fan. Uh, jumping in a, in a, in a tube now. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, he's also Mario, apparently. Yeah. Um, well, anyway. That's, that's, gonna... how people, that's how people in Brooklyn get around exclusively by pipe. Yeah. And not tube, like I said. Um, yeah, no, I like that. I like that the parents are ta- – the way they're talking about it. It's also just a great reveal that because when they're kind of they kind of look like they're sneaking around a little bit like they're she's like shh be quiet be quiet be quiet and it's like oh the parents are like maybe the parents are gonna get involved and they're gonna be like oh you can't see him blah 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 they're gonna trick her um, into not like not knowing that he's going off to war but that's not where they go with it and the parents are completely aware of it which I think is funny because I think she doesn't think that they are completely aware of it and oh yeah they, and everybody knows it's a great reveal <laughs> though it's a, it's a fun reveal yeah. that they're just like oh yeah we know we know what's going on <laughs> oh when Boris creeps into his house and grandma's already up yeah and, and she's like, like oh, what are you doing up grandma and she's like oh I haven't gone I yeah he's like what are you doing still awake and she's like I have already gotten up for the day mister <laughs> and then he slathers her with wait no that's the that's a different movie sorry oh my that's the uh that's the cranes are fucking. Sorry, sorry, Jason. My bad. <laughs> it's the Bob Guccione production from the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So it's just their their romance is believable, and it's it's a smart move to have them already in love at the beginning of the movie. I think that's I think that's smart because I think it's harder. To, I think it's harder to buy into like. Uh, the falling in love part. I think it's more fun if it's like, well, they're already together and you can tell like just on their body language and the way they're talking to each other and everything. Yeah. But look, if, if there were, if we had to see them fall in love, Brendan, they'd have to add a whole other hour onto this movie. This movie would be two and a half hours long and it would be too long. Well, but, but let's just, let's not forget. We did get a movie where two people fell in love and it was one of the best movies we talked about. And that was brief encounter. And that's, and that was only like 85 minutes. And then we saw a movie with the exact same plot that we hated. It was called The English Patient. <laughs> and that was a lot more than 85 minutes. Oh, yeah. Or if it wasn't, it sure felt like it. <laughs> it might have been good if it was 85 minutes. Maybe. But then we wouldn't have got the Willem Dafoe scenes, which are easily the best part. <laughs> That's true. You, you, uh, Jason, you're giving me a look like you don't even remember he was in that movie. <laughs> you might... That's right. He was. Didn't, didn't he fuck his hands up or something? Yeah. He gets like tortured that... in one scene, I think. Was Colin Keith ready in that movie too? Who knows? I don't remember. Colin Firth crashed a, a biplane. That's all I know. That was what twenty eighteen. We did that movie. It was a long time ago. A long time. We were both in our twenties. Yeah. Um. Just don't worry about it. Uh. So. <laughs> uh. Veronica is um also again. I know I say this a lot when we talk about old movies, but it has to be said. Veronica is a very strong female character for nineteen fifty seven. I mean, she has a lot of yeah. shit done to her. 
Um, and she doesn't exactly get to like kick anyone's ass or anything, but that's not what I mean by strong female character. I just mean one that has like characteristics and is not just like a punching bag. Um, she does feel like, uh, it does feel like men keep trying to take her agency away though. Right. Like yeah. that, maybe not Boris, but it certainly feels like Mark tries to do that. Um, and to a lesser extent, maybe the guy at the end who might want to fuck her, but I don't think he's quite as awful as Mark in that regard. Um, but it does feel like everybody's trying to reduce her to, you know, oh, this woman or, ah, oh, this broad, like you said, when that guy's doing the speech and he's literally describing what he thinks that she's done and saying that women that do this are worse than the fucking Nazis, Jason. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how do you take that? How do you not want to throw yourself in front of a train yeah. after hearing that? Exactly. And and not only just from anybody, but from the guy who is essentially the person that has taken you in yeah. and and is the only family you have left. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some, like, critique. Uh, there's some po- politics shit in here, like, a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. I know it, one one scene that really stands out to me. So early on, they have uh, they have dinner. And um, it's uh, Boris. Is, Boris is having dinner with his family, and these two people come over from the factory where Boris works, and they're like, "On behalf of the factory, we give you these, uh, you know, these yeah. gifts or whatever." They're like from the Young Communist League. Right? Yeah, yeah. And of course, the father is like, "Oh yes, of course, great." You know, they go, they, we, it's kind of it's kind of a. a it kind of holds true because it felt to yeah. me like a critique of like when corporations say like they're for like black lives matter and stuff like that. Like it's very yeah. like fake sentimentality. It, it's, and it's very much of like, I live in the society. We all know the speech. We know what it said. We know what you guys say when you come and give us something. Don't worry about it. Sit down and have a drink. Like, yeah, they're like, you, you don't have, we, we get it. You spare us. <laughs> you don't have to go through the bullshit. Like we get it. But you just, you, but also that's exactly a sort of scene that I doubt you would have ever seen in the Stalin era. No, of course not. No, because that's a critique of, of some yeah. aspect of government and corporate and corporations. There was another line that made me kind of look at it sideways like that, where he says, oh, the only thing you got to worry about is the police. There you go. Yeah. Again, this is like, oh. four years after um, he was gone. So this is like yeah. kind of revolutionary. This is like the first one. It took them four years to really be like, oh, no, we can do this now. Yeah. Like we can, <laughs> we're not under I mean, someone's thumb anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that the Soviet Union didn't ever have its problems, but one of the things that it did do after Stalin died is it did make a conscious effort to kind of de-Stalinify the the nation as much as they could, like to to get rid of that cult of personality. And I really don't think that any Soviet leader thereafter quite had that level of cult of personality. I mean, Khrushchev certainly was remembered, but I don't know that he had that. Mm-hmm. And and well, I mean, maybe Gorbachev at the end, but even that, like. He kind of ended communism, so... <laughs> yeah, and uh, we got a really good guy down there now. Oh, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Gotta love those S- FSB guys. I love Putin. Putin, it's my favorite Canadian treat. And my favorite man. My favorite horseback man. <laughs> um, yeah, no, he's terrible. Um, the other thing is, too, like you said to the cities, I don't know, I don't know if this was... I don't know if this is valid, but I noticed that like when the when in the scenes where like before, you know, they find out war is declared, they start going off to volunteer and fight and everything. And then when we cut to a scene later where Veronica's on the phone seeing if there's been any word. Jack, she's actually calling the factory, which is funny, to see if yeah. they had heard anything about Boris. And it's funny, they blow her off pretty quickly. They're like, No, 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 we haven't. Bye. Like the the the, yeah. the, the the tone has changed drastically. But what I thought was interesting is that the city looks very different in this scene. Like, I don't know what those are called. Those things in the streets that are like, they're crossed. They're kind of like big steel. Oh, they're anti-tank uh, barriers. Is that what they are? Okay. I forget. I, don't, I can't remember exactly what the, what the slang name for them is. But yeah, similar to what would have been seen at Normandy on the beach. Yeah. So they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're all over the place. And they weren't there yeah. before in the earlier scenes. Um, and also, like, the camera gets up a lot higher, too. I don't know how they pulled this off in 1957. Mm-hmm. This is impressive. But there's shots from overhead that are so mm-hmm. high up. Like, especially when they're showing, like, the titular cranes. And then mm-hmm. we reverse almost from the cranes POV. And you're yeah. like, how the fuck did they get the camera up that high? Like, that's incredible. Well, they did have helicopters at that time, so. But, I mean, a helicopter shot. 
but a crane can only go so high. And in 1957, a helicopter shot would have been like your budget. Like that would have been Brendan, the, the title of this movie is not referring to birds. What? It's talking about the cranes they used to film it. Oh. Those cranes were flying. So wait, I think the documentary you could also just call the cranes are flying. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so just be with the crane shots in the movie. The cranes of the cranes are flying are flying. Yeah. The, yeah. It's just people throwing uh, cranes and jibs at each other. He's <laughs> using trebuchets to huck cranes into the air. <laughs> <laughs> what are those? Those are cranes. Watch out. <laughs> just wait till we see this footage. Oh, boy. Oh, my God. It's going to be nuts if we can recover it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Somebody catch the crane. Um. <laughs> anyway... Uh, yeah. So I just thought, like, I just thought, like, that was that was a pretty decisive change. Was the the look of the the look of the city, um, and like you said, the crowds get more like it gets packed like a can of sardines, especially when you see mm-hmm. the hospital scenes. Yeah. Um. That's that's rough. <laughs> that's right. But also during the victory parade at the end, and we have that like that high three quarter shot over the crowd. Mm. It's actually it's actually a really cool shot because we're following. Um, Veronica through the crowd. It's like it's like the camera's handheld and it's following her through the crowd. And then at some point, it kind of swings around her and goes up into the air a bit. And we see this like overhead shot of the uh, or three quarter shot of the of like the parade coming through and all the people crammed into the onto the street. Yeah, it's really cool. It's a great use of space. We also, you know, we never talked about the uh, a key plot element too is that um, Boris gives her a, a, st- a stuffed uh, squirrel. Like a the yes, thing that he the runner yeah he gives he gives her that before he leaves and he puts a little like love note in the basket, um, mm-hmm. and that and that obviously that doesn't get seen for a long time like she doesn't know that there's a note in there, no. um, but to which I but th- to which I wrote, I get why you put the acorns on top to like keep it in there but like man take a few of those acorns out you got to make it more obvious I, I guess he just wanted her to find it at some random point I know, and be like I happy know. to see I it, know. but but here's the thing too remember throughout most of the movie she is desperately waiting for a letter from him she is like running up to the post person when they get there mm-hmm. she just wants to hear from him any sign from him so when later in the movie when we see a uh, fucking mark go and grab that squirrel and wrap it up and take it with him it's like you piece of shit yeah it gives it you a motherfucker it gives it so much weight because not that's just that's not yeah. just like a present that he gave her that's like the one thing that tells her how he felt. Well, I mean, she knew how he yeah. felt, but that's another, that's just a ref, uh, um, I don't know how to say this, uh, reaffirming, I guess. Yeah. How, how, but it's, it's, it's the letter that she wanted and she had it all along yeah. and didn't know. And he almost gives it to, cause Mark is cheating on her yeah. and he almost gives it to that girl's kid. And of course, Veronica comes in and rips that thing out of his hand and gives him a good like seven or eight smacks, which is great. Like, fuck that dude. Yeah. Um, And and that's what I mean when I say Veronica is like not just a punching bag because she does step up a few times. And that's that's one of those moments where she's like, no, fuck this. I'm not a victim. I'm going to I'm going to smack this guy in the face. Um, and then the message inside. Yeah, 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 yeah. The message inside says, uh, "My only love, happy birthday to you. Uh, on this day, you came into the world. It's hard to leave you, but what can we do? This is war. There's no way around it. We can't continue living happily as we did before when death stalks our land. But we'll be happy yet. I love you. I have faith in you. Yours, Boris. So, damn. It's pretty. Uh, it's 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 a lot. <laughs> it's pretty sad." But then, Jason, uh, you were starting to talk about that last scene um, in mm. the movie where they're having the parade. Um, but she's she's still she's got that last bit of hope that she's going to see Boris. And yeah. the moment she f- she has all these like she has this bouquet of flowers, and this guy is like, "Oh, you got to give it. To, you, you go give it to your uh, to your love to, to your you know lover coming home." And the moment she realizes that she. It, that he's not going to show up is when she starts handing them out to people in the crowd. Well, she, she goes, she, I guess she talks to Stepan who was in, um, right. He essentially was in Boris's unit. Yeah. And he is the guy that confirms to her. I don't even think we hear anything or see any subtitles. I think he just kind of silently confirms to her that, yeah, he is dead. Well, he says, he, and, he says that, she, um, that he's pretty sure he's dead because he says, yeah. she says, did, did, did you see him being buried? And he said, no, when I left, someone was going up to check on him. 
Yeah. Right. So then you're like, oh, so she still got that little bit of that sh- little shred of hope still barely. But I think in that Which, moment, yeah. she finally realizes like, no, this is it. Like that he's not coming back. Yeah. And then and then, yeah, that moment of her then turning around and starting to hand out the flowers to everybody around her. Yeah. Such a beautiful moment of like acceptance. Yeah. It's just like, well, I'm not going to like I have to move on. I have to keep living. I have to move forward. It, it feels like she's not defeated at the end of the movie you know she's no it 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 feels like she's she's allowing herself to enjoy the taste of victory Mm -hmm. but also and and that in combined with accepting that boris is gone like finally letting it go and finding a certain inner peace and in that moment being compelled to hand the flowers out to everybody around her like yeah it's it's not it's certainly not a happy ending but it's a hopeful ending i think for her yeah um, it's a cathartic ending for her. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, I think she's going to be okay kind of thing. Yeah. Which is which is cool to see in a movie like where where the guy dies and and the woman doesn't just like fucking kill herself, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like it 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 feels like in, in a war movie when the soldier dies, then the woman just goes insane and she storms yeah. out and she turns into a psychopath. Like I'm glad they didn't go yeah. that route. Um, and we have at the same time that she's kind of going through that process. We have Stepin giving that speech where he's talking about, you know, we're going to continue to hate war. We're going to, you know, we didn't fight this war to destroy. We fought this war to build a future. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do mm-hmm. uh, for everybody that, and, and basically make sure that everybody who gave their lives, it was worth it. Yeah. That's where the movie ends. Um, Jason, do you have any other big things you want to mention before we go into our bits and our bombs? We will talk about it in there, Brendan, okay. and we will begin deliberations on the assignment of points. Okay. So don't go anywhere, folks. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back after this. Age of Radio. Hello. I'm Sir Reginald Topser. I was the head, head of the committee of the House of Lords on investigation into tobacco companies in the 1960s. And in that report, we determined, through extensive study, that Viceroy cigarettes are the healthiest cigarettes that one person can enjoy. Have you ever said to yourself, oh, the cigarette I smoke is delicious, but it hurts my throat? Viceroy doesn't do that because Viceroy has the soft, in bracing hand of a colonial administrator working with the people that he has conquered and is exploiting. Yes, Viceroy cigarettes are for VIPs like you, your wife, and your children. Viceroy cigarettes, now available in junior flavors, including mint, chocolate, and strawberry vanilla. Viceroy, you're worth it. Guys, we're going to find out the mystery. We're going to find out the mystery. Is this a war movie or is this not a war movie? Is this movie not a war movie? I almost messed up the line and Jason kind of looked at me like he was going to correct me. But really, it's also time for bits and bombs. I just wanted to set up that we're also going to answer that question from earlier. But now it's time for bits and bombs. The cranes are flying overhead. And Jason's looking up with binoculars. And he's thinking, hey, cranes, I'm going to throw some bits and bombs at you. Sorry, cranes. I don't like you, cranes. I'm going to blow you up and eat all those cranes for bits and bombs. So... I don't know if this is a thing for Russian movies, but they, for some reason, up front list all the awards this movie got, I, and it's I, like, guys, we get it. You got awards. I think that's a. I think that's specifically Criterion. I don't think that's the, the movie at all. But that was like, the, but it was all in Russian. Like it was all Russian shit. It was. It was. It wasn't Criterion. It still looked very clean. And like it looked like it was added after the fact. So I think either they even gave the director a photo. I think David Spielberg never got a photo in the credits. <laughs> I think either it was. Um, a re-release years later or it was Criterion adding it to the beginning of the movie. I really think we need to start putting director's photos in the uh, in the credits. I don't think the world needs to see Uwe Boll's face that much. <laughs> Please. I need to know. I need to know who the man was that made Blood Rain. I need to see it. You need someone to blame. You need someone to blood blame. Yep. 
uh, somebody at one point used the phrase, did you rip it? And I, th- I thought he was like making like a, uh, like saying, did you fuck her? Did you rip well, I it? I thought it was a fart reference. Or could have, yeah, but it wasn't. <laughs> I just wrote down exemptions, a true commodity in Soviet Russia. That's true. <laughs> it really is. No. And Soviet Russia, of course, is uh, for the people, but as corrupt as anywhere else. Um, we love the corruption, don't we, Jason? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's really what makes the world go round, mm-hmm. corruption. At one point, I'm pretty sure Boris says the phrase, nothing will happen to me, which in a war movie you do not say. Ever. Because if you don't, or if you do say it, you've sealed your fate. But then sometimes oh. it's so overt that they do survive because you're expecting it That's to true. not be true. But then it is. Yeah. Um, there's a shot. There's another shot in this movie. It's like it's almost like a Venetian blinds effect that they do. It's the scene where um, Boris tells Veronica that he's going off to war. Or I guess his friend kind of reveals that. But they find out that Boris is going to war. And it, it's interesting. And I'm going to put my tiny film glasses on right now, Jason, if please, you don't mind. Please. Um, I feel like... I feel like it's almost like the scene itself because the light part of the scene, like the good part of the scene is that they're talking about their romance and Veronica's talking about marriage and, and that they're going to be together and everything. And then the dark part of that is that Boris is actually telling her, yeah, I'm, I'm going to war. So that's shitty. Hopefully that works out. But you know what I mean? Like it's like a light and dark effect. And there's also Are you like, talking about where they're like holding each other and they're get both getting the Shatner light on their eyes. Yeah, but it's like, but yeah. it's like the blinds. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, yeah. like part of the scene is like very happy and everything, but also obviously the other side of it is this is the scene where we find out he's going to war and may not come back. I thought that perhaps Veronica was maybe in love with Boris in a way that was maybe unhealthy. Okay. Like, it, I mean, there's puppy love, but she felt positively obsessed with him. And I mean, maybe that's maybe that's a choice to make this, you know, to make this feel that much stronger. But it did come off as a bit much. I now, mean, the actress is 23, so she could be yeah. playing 17. And that's and that's fine. That's I'm not I'm not criticizing the performance. I'm, I'm going to assume it was a choice, mm-hmm. but that's just she just comes off that way. <laughs> but. Again, that maybe that was a choice to make the, the to make this hurt even more, I guess, as a tragedy. Um, well, and I wonder if the because starting her at that level makes it all the more effective when she comes to the realization when she accepts it at the end. Yeah, is that she's kind of, in a way, grown up throughout this war. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and you're yeah, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. I thought it was kind of a, an interesting scene where Dad, like he. Somebody says we should have a drink at Dad's. Like, no, we need to get fucked up. Go to the medicine cabinet. It's like, what are you drinking? Are you guys just drinking a bunch of fucking morphine or something? Like, you're really going to get fucked up? He just had a yeah. glass full of vodka, I think. Dad likes to party. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, I suppose they could probably keep vodka in the in the medicine cabinet. You know, it's, it's great for disinfecting wounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? Oh, that shot when she runs out into the into the street and there's a bunch of tanks rolling down the street. First off, great shot. They had all those tanks for it. But she like runs between them. And it's and again, it's one of these kind of like uplifted three quarter shots. Maybe it was on a crane or something, but it was just a really, really nice shot and something I didn't expect from a movie from 1957. Uh, a similar, a, a similar shot, a similar shot, similar shot. This is a Herbert a similar Schindler. shot. That uh, uh, was when she, and this was similar to the end of the movie too, where she's at the fence and she's looking for Boris and it's like a dolly running alongside the fence as she runs along through the crowd trying to like get through, like again, such a really cool use of the camera Mm -hmm. and to keep it moving in a way that, you know, in an American movie at the time, that wouldn't happen. You just stick a camera down somewhere and she'd run up to the fence, you know? Well, and similarly, we didn't mention, sorry, I should correct myself, similarly, um, there's Thank also you. the scene where she, um, where the bomb goes, bombs go off and she's just going home uh, from the subway and is running to, to her house. Cause she's noticing all these like firefighters around and stuff yeah. and she's running and running and running and we're running with her. And then when she yeah. gets to the house again, we get this dizzying kind of movement as she realizes that her house has been bombed out and her parents are dead. And it's yeah. such like a devastating, like she's right in the middle of the frame with her back to the camera, just looking. And then as soon as the guy kind of pulls her away, he's like, you know, you can't be in here. He just looks at her face and he's yeah. like, oh, I'm so sorry. He like realizes yeah. immediately what's happened. It's so effective. The movie doesn't even tell you what's happened. Like the no. movie does well, never, never no. uh, spells it out for you. They're like, no. they, they, it doesn't treat us like radiance, Jason. Well, 
what's great about that sequence, among other things, is that first off, it reminds me of Fires Were Started, that whole sequence mm. with the firefighters, you know, dealing with bombed out buildings and stuff. It just immediately, especially with the black and white, it called back to that in my mind. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so she goes in and what's interesting is like she goes to the where her apartment is and she runs up the stairs and when they and they show her going up the stairs, I'm pretty sure that's the exact same shot when she went down the stairs a previous time, oh. except this time the whole place is blown the fuck up. She goes up those stairs and when she opens the door, she just opens the door and the entire apartment is gone. She just sees out into the sky. Yeah. Like there's nothing there. And that's just, yeah, again, they don't explicitly tell us what happened, but it, it's such a great use that you just show us. And mm-hmm. we know exactly what happened. This movie, it thankfully, is of the uh, the school of thought of show rather than tell, which is, yeah. I think, the mark of, uh, the usually the mark of a better movie. Let me put on my tiny film glasses for a sec. Oh, yeah. Showing and not telling is what we must do in a visual medium. 100%. I'm going to take those glasses off. So oh. hold on a sec. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whew. Those barely fit you, Jason. I know. They're very tiny. Um, no, it's it, it, like, I mean, we talked about the complete opposite when we talked about uh, Fatherland in that scene yeah. where that woman is like, this is the Holocaust and let me tell yeah. you all about it. And yeah. it's like... Let me, let me tell the entire plan from the beginning. Yeah, like it's like that is the extreme. That and this scene are like the extremes of each other. Like True. you have a movie. You don't need to like do... And I know it's probably a lot to do with, like, I know studios interfere and stuff and producers get involved, but, like... And with Fatherland, it was a TV movie. They only had a limited budget. It was, you know, they couldn't rebuild an entire Holocaust camp for their purposes or Well, something. no, I'm not saying you have to show us the Holocaust, but, I mean, there's other ways. They could have not had most of that scene in the movie. Like, we... We're, Let's not relitigate Fatherland. We're figuring it out with the investigation, is what I'm saying. But I'm just yeah. saying that, like, I, I think I think... That happens so much, and I'm like, I'm always grateful to see a movie that doesn't do that. Because <laughs> I'm like, well, why do we need these exposition dumps? This is so silly. You are correct. Thanks. You get a point for yourself. Thanks. Oh, does that mean I am a war movie? Uh, yeah. Oh, sick. Brendan's a war movie, folks. Yeah. Congratulations. Uh, I'm about the Boer so- War, the best war. I was reminded, of course, of Battlefield Earth while watching this movie because I saw a couple of Dutch angles. Okay. (laughs) But here here they were used properly. Properly (laughs) and and with, uh, you know, just as uh, occasionally. Not the entire movie and for no No. reason. (laughs) No. (laughs) There's reasons. Something crazy (laughs) is about to happen. Okay. You can't just say that for 120 minutes, Battlefield Earth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the with that. So when the piano was playing over the air raid sirens, we talked about that. That's a great scene. The love confession in the maelstrom of the bombing. I love their their simulation of the bombing. Like that, they went all out with it. Like they went like heavy bombing. Like boom, 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 boom. Flash, flash, flash. Like they were mm-hmm. making it an intense sequence, and I appreciated that. I like a good intense bombing in a movie. Uh, you, <laughs> you tell me that every day. Oh, and when so when Boris gets shot, because we talk about that whole sequence, but the but the very beginning of that, he gets shot, and there's this shot where the camera is pointing up at the sun, and it does like a pull zoom thing, mm-hmm. where it looks like that where it's almost like he's falling down to the ground, but it's like just having the sun like get pushed back in the zoom. It's so cool, and it really drives home that he's been shot and he's like falling to the ground, and in that moment, that's when that whole sequence happens. It's kind of it's kind of uh, similar ish to. Um sort of like the Hitchcock shot, like the pull focus shot. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Not the but, same but thing, but of, it's like in the same... But instead of doing it to a face family. or like somebody on a set, it's doing it to the sun and looking yeah. it straight at the sky. And it's a weird effect, but it works so well. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, oh, they do that um, uh, carrying the guy on his back through a battlefield shot that we talked about yep. in... Uh, I almost said Island in the Sun, A Walk in the Sun. Walk in the Sun. Uh, did it happen in the Walk in the Sun or happened, it happened in Attack? I, anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm, and I know it happens in Hacksaw Ridge many times. <laughs> yeah. So I just, again, I want to point out every time I see it, I was surprised to see it in this movie. I was like, oh, that's a pretty popular uh, war movie trope. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No Man Left Behind, you know. Yeah. Uh, Mark gives away the squirrel, that asshole I wrote. Uh, 
Yeah, that lady wanted to go for a ride and be like, oh, we must – because it just comes out of nowhere. Like I get the – obviously, we get the purpose of this character, but it's so funny. Like out of nowhere, this this lady is super horny and she's like, oh, I just want to go for a drive like when I was a girl, a random drive. And he's like, oh, uh, yeah, but gas is rationed. I don't know if we can get a car. And she's like, oh, you'd best get a car. And he's like, well, I'm hard. Let's go find a car. <laughs> And then, of course, that allows us to find out that uh, uh, Mark is, a, in addition to being a rapist, is also a fucking uh, draft dodger. Yeah. Um, I, I also thought, like, the scene where she's told by the the other soldier that was with um, that was with Boris at the time about um, Boris's death, he, he doesn't yeah. realize who she is, that she's, like, no. Veronica, that she was his girlfriend and so he's he's telling her and he's like oh like i'll tell you because you're not with the family but i gotta tell them that boris died and he does this so casually which i think mm. it's not his fault i'm not saying like he's it's it's a fault for him doing it like that but that's gotta sting even more for someone well, to and just then drop he's it like, like yeah that. i gotta tell her i gotta tell his fiance too yeah and she goes that's me yeah <laughs> brutal but she's still, at this point, even after he tells her, she's still convinced that he's alive and that there's hope that he'll come back. Yeah. Um, and then the war ends and we get to that last scene, which is so cool. Uh, the only thing I have to ask about, and you know what? I'm willing to accept that cultures are different and things happen. You know, I don't. But when, uh, uh, what's his face? Um, the guy that was out there with. Uh, Steppen. Steppen, yeah. Steppen, he meets his daughter and he like, he just kisses her butt. He just like kisses the baby's butt. Yeah. Baby's got a bare butt and he just kisses the baby's butt. And I guess it's yeah. cute. Baby's got cute butts. It's just, I've never seen somebody kiss a baby's butt in a movie. I've never seen somebody kiss a baby's butt in real life. You know, because a lot, because poo comes from there. So well, you don't he doesn't, get baby's he butt. doesn't kiss her butthole, Jason. <laughs> well, no, no. I'm not saying, I'm not saying he's sucking her butthole. Well, it's, I'm just saying, it's, it's just strange that he's kissing her butt. That's how you made it sound. You're like, poo comes out of there. I'm like, not her butt cheek. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, you know, ba- babies don't have a lot of control and, you know, I could get it, you know, even if you're near it, you got to be careful. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, Jason. If this movie was directed by David Zucker, surely when he kissed her butt, <laughs> shit would have went all over yeah. his face. <laughs> Peter Fairley presents oh, The Cranes Are Flying yeah. Up Your Butt. And the world will die that day. <laughs> Yeah, that's all I got. Oh, and of course we get the shot of the cranes overhead of the movie. Mm-hmm. Good, good job. You got to bookend the movie with that. It would, I would, I, you know what? I'd be mad. I'd have stormed into the theater screaming if it wasn't there. I'm s- it's crazy. You watched this in a theater for this for this podcast. Yeah, no, I did. I, I read it in a theater and said, "Project this. <laughs> Project it now, sir." I've <laughs> brought along a. Uh, I brought along the Criterion Channel. Hook it up. I have a. I have a 480p DivX rip <laughs> from 2002. <laughs> I want you to play it on the big screen for me. It's a VHS rip. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll I'll mention a couple things about this movie. I don't have a whole lot, but um, uh, one of the one of the things about this movie is as a cinematographer because we should mention his name because he's amazing, but Sergei Urusevsky, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned okay. his name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He. This was seen as a uh, obviously a very ground groundbreaking camera work, and he used a lot of handheld cameras. Um, I guess he had learned how to film like this because he was a military cameraman during the war. Mm-hmm. So he just took that and 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 used it here. It just looks great. It looks just real. It looks real, but then there's also parts where it obviously looks fabricated. But to the to the to great effect like it's supposed yeah. to look uh otherworldly at times um yep. and again i already mentioned when this film was released in the soviet union it caused a huge sensation people were tired of propaganda stuff and they got to see something like this and they were very excited and apparently it, it helped people kind of cope with yeah. losing people in the war because they were able to yeah. see something where people lost people in the war and they were like oh shit we can identify with this now Seeing somebody go through that, where they they don't want to they don't want to admit that they're dead, and then having that moment of finally accepting it, like yeah. like that they either themselves had gone through that or had watched family members and friends go through that. Exactly, this is the only Russian film to win the uh, Cannes Film Festival's Golden Palm for Best Picture. Wow, yeah. Uh, and then I'll just talk a little bit about the reaction to this movie. Uh, this is, of course, um, like I said, Soviet Union was very. Overwhelm, overwhelmingly positive. Um, the lead actress of this movie actually became very popular in Europe after this. Uh, uh, following the film's victory at the Cannes Film Festival, 
Uh, the world celebrated the film's main protagonist, and critics hailed the production for its stunning cinematography, acting, direction, and editing. Um, somebody uh, compared, actually, somebody is a, a French liberation commentator, um, contrasted uh, her character, Veronica, with that of Bridget Bardot. Like made some comparisons there, uh, which who, she was obviously an icon in France at the time. Um, and she also, uh, the, the actress Tatiana, who played Veronica, remembered receiving a watch from her East German fans during a festival there. And the gift featured the inscription, finally, we see on the Soviet screen a face, not a mask. So that's a that, that's a telling, <laughs> the telling note right it's there. It's a good line. It is, yeah. Um, I don't have a lot of information about the budget in the box office, but I know it was very successful. Uh, but it did go to the BAFTAs, Jason. Did not go to the Oscars, but it did go to the BAFTAs. And it got nominated for two awards, but did not win them. Any guesses? Uh, best cinematography and best actor for, or sorry, best actress for, um, yes, her. <laughs> Say the name. Um, yes, it. Uh, well, you're right about one of them. Uh, for some reason, it doesn't get nominated for best cinematography, which is absolutely wow. insane. Um, it gets nominated for Tatiana Samolova for best foreign actress. You know who wins that year, Jason? Uh, Our old pal uh, Simone Signore for Room at the Top. Oh, and it also gets nominated for Best Film from any source, which I guess is the equivalent of like Best Overall Film uh, yeah. years later. And that also goes to Room at the Top. You know what? I liked huh. Room at the Top, and I liked her in Room at the Top. But I feel like this is a better movie than Room at the Top. <laughs> I would agree with you on that. <laughs> um, but that's pretty much that's pretty much what I have. Um, if you don't mind, Jason, I'll start off this little bit. Uh, I know we're going to talk. Do you want to talk about it first and then make our decision? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about okay. it first and we'll come to our conclusion. Well, I think this is a beautiful movie. This is a gorgeous looking movie. It's it's a it's not even a long movie. So for people who are like, I don't know if I want to watch this artsy fartsy shit, it's 97 minutes. It's also not boring. It moves at a clip. It's uh it's a believable romance, it's great performances, great filmmaking. Just wonderful i love it can't say any, any i can't say enough good things about it jason yeah when it comes to the quality of the movie i have to agree with you it is it is a fantastically made movie it's beautifully shot the performances are real uh you know the story is is engaging and and you know when it all comes together at the end of it, it you're, you're left kind of like wow what a film yeah so quality wise, this is a fantastic movie, and and is a I have to imagine is like a paramount example of Soviet cinema. Mm, it has to be up there for sure. Yeah. Now, we both like this movie, but that's not what we're here to figure out, Brandon. We're here to answer the question: mm. Is this movie a war movie, or is this movie not a war movie? So, Brendan, what what, what are you thinking? What are you uh, what are you working with here? Well, I was going back and forth on this one. Um, and I know Paste Magazine's definition is there, and I don't think we need to necessarily be Slavin to that uh, mm -hmm, definition. Mm -hmm. But I will say that I think war really does permeate this movie, and I think I think just the idea that, I mean, the whole movie is jump-started by the fact that Boris is going to war. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. climate of the, of the Soviet Union changes throughout the film because of the war. I mean, mm -hmm. everything kind of happens because of the war. This is a story that takes place in war. I mean, would you say Titanic is not about the Titanic sinking because it's about a romance between uh, DiCaprio and Winslet? I would say it's still about the Titanic sinking. So, yeah, I don't know. I th I would say that it is. I would say it's a war movie. Okay. Brennan, Brennan has voted in favor of it being a war movie. Now, what does Jason think? Well... <laughs> I've been thinking about it, too, and my personal criteria for a war movie is that it is a movie that is set during the war, but also is about living and experiencing things through the war. It's a broader definition, certainly, than Paceless, but I think this movie applies, because this movie is about the experience of people, and this experience, in all ways, is being influenced by the war that is going on around them. This isn't this is not a story that is happening independently set against the backdrop of a war, although I suppose the argument could be made that if a war is going on, it's affecting everything. But in terms of narrative, every every bit of this narrative involves the war in some way. So by that definition, I have to agree that this movie is, in fact, a war movie. And Brendan, ding, 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 ding. That means that this movie has two points 
two points. Congratulations to this week's movie, The Cranes Are Flying. You are, in fact, a war movie. Two points. Wow. Great job. The Cranes Are Flying. You did it. I had faith in you, um, and uh, because of watching you, I... <laughs> I figured you would win at least one point because uh, I thought you were a war movie. So there you go. So just before, just uh, as an addendum to that, we have to let you know that this week's winner, uh, the cranes are flying. The descendants of all the people that were involved in this movie will be sent two cartons of Viceroy cigarettes oh, no. direct from for screen and country as a thanks for their relatives making what we consider a war movie. Smoke them up, guys. Enjoy it. I'm really getting tired of the cigarette propaganda on this show. It's really, uh, we're starting to get some we're letters. We're making so much money, Brendan. Stop it, Jason. We're starting to get letters, and I don't mean like, and I don't, and I don't mean emails. Like people are writing letters. That's how mad they are. Wow. Yeah. This... Wow. We're making it, man. Wow. We just turn into John Travolta there for a second. <laughs> wow, man. We're making it. Is sending us letters. You know, they send us letters, and if they say bad things, oh, I just say, you know, I'm rubbing your glue. What bounces off me sticks to you. Whoa. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, whatever his character's name is. Vinny Barbarino. Thank you, Mr. Carter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, Jason, we are going to go back to the list next week. We are going to go back to the All list right. for a while. Um for a little bit uh we're gonna go back to the list and we're gonna talk about a movie on this list that is about the american civil war yeah we're doing it again and this movie is called the red badge of courage jason speaking of short movies this movie is 69 minutes long yeah this is a movie i've heard of that there's a mythical lost cut of yeah, well, I think it was. I think there was a, a longer cut because he definitely filmed mm-hmm. a longer cut, but it, it was apparently destroyed in a studio fire, which I also kind of yeah. believe because this, the quality of film was not great. Um, film is extremely flammable. Yeah. <laughs> At least it was back then. So this movie, of course, directed by uh, John Huston, um, released in 1951, simply... Very, very straightforward plot summary. Truncated adaptation of Stephen Crane's novel about a Civil War Union soldier who struggles to find the courage to fight in the heat of battle. Yes, sir. Starring Mr. Audie Murphy. Um, so we're going to we're gonna talk about that one. Audie Murphy, if you folks don't remember, is one of, the, if not the most decorated soldier of World War II who after the war decided, I'm going to be an actor. Yeah, and was very successful. And played himself in a fucking movie, and then went on to be in other movies, too. Spoiler alert, pretty sure he wins an Oscar for that movie. If not, he yeah. definitely won an Oscar for something. Oh, yeah. But I'm I'm looking forward to this. I like a good hour and nine minute movie, so this will be, yeah. <laughs> this will be, this will be Can't fun. Can't argue with 69 minutes Six, up top, my brother. Giggity. Um, so that's what we'll talk about next week, Jason, the Red Badge of Courage. But until then... Just got to say, you can uh, you can find us out there. We're on all the podcast apps. Our home base, you can go to ageofradio.org slash for screen. And country. So if you want to listen to us on a website, listen to us there. If you want to listen to us on a podcast app, find us on an app. Um, if you want to find us on Facebook, just search for our name there. We're on, we're on there. We're doing our thing. We're doing our stuff. Uh, we're on the, the hateful social media site known as Twitter at FSACpod, mm-hmm. as in for screen. And country. Podcast. We're also on the much more positive site known as Blue Sky at FSAC Pod. That's for screen. Yes, uh, and country. Podcast. And of course, I'm on both platforms. My handle is at Jason D. McLeod. I'm on both, so find me there. Yeah. So there you go. Um, but yeah, so until next week, Red Badge of Courage. We'll talk about it then. Jason, I've just gotta I've just gotta take a real wide stance, as uh, yep. some of my favorite politicians do as well. And I'm going to look at you right in your eyeballs, and I'm going to say to you with every bit of confidence mm-hmm. in my body and every bit of worrisome soul in my nethers, and okay. I will yep. say to you, okay, God save the king. Do you want to go glory holing? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, for Screen and Country, yeah. I'm Brendan. I'm Jason. Let's get the fuck out of yeah, here. Let's go glory holing! Woo! Could, could I come? Oh, you will, Jim. You will. Oh, hot dog. The movie. Let's make sure the drums are smacking.